In this segment, we'll go over some basic results in linear algebra as a prelude to our discussion of dynamical systems. So we'll begin by discussing the linear independence of vectors and the invertibility of matrices, then talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, then we'll see how you can diagonalize a matrix using its eigenvectors provided that all of its eigenvalues are real and distinct. Then we'll discuss the case of complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors and show how these eigenvectors can be used to transform a matrix into a simpler canonical form. Now these transformations are enormously useful in the analysis of dynamical systems as we'll see later in the course. First let's define linear independence. So suppose you have a set of k column vectors in Rn. We say that these vectors are linearly independent if whenever a linear combination of these vectors equals zero, then all of the coefficients ci must also equal zero. And we say that they are linearly dependent otherwise. Now if the vectors x1 to xk in Rn are linearly independent, and you have some other vector, call it y, that can be expressed as a linear combination of these, then the coefficients of this linear combination, the di, are uniquely determined. In other words, if your vectors x1 to xk are linearly independent, you can't express y as a linear combination of these in two different ways. Now the proof of this is just a couple of lines and I'll leave it as an exercise. Next consider the invertibility of matrices. We say that an n by n matrix A is invertible if there exists a matrix C such that if you pre-multiply A by C or post-multiply it by C, you get the identity matrix. And if there exists such a matrix C, we call it the inverse matrix and it's uniquely determined and denoted as shown on the slide. And if a matrix is not invertible, we say that it's singular. Now a result that we're going to use is the following. A matrix is invertible if and only if its columns are linearly independent. Now the proof of this is routine and you can look it up, but it's a bit tedious so I'm going to skip it. Next we define eigenvectors and eigenvalues. We say that a column vector z is an eigenvector of a matrix A if it's a non-zero solution to the equation shown on the slide, az equals lambda z, for some real number lambda. And lambda is called an eigenvalue of A and z is the eigenvector associated with lambda. Now note that eigenvalues and eigenvectors may be complex even if A is real. In fact, complex eigenvalues play an important role in the analysis of oscillations or economic fluctuations. Note also that lambda is an eigenvalue of A if and only if the matrix A minus lambda i is singular. Now to see this, just look at the equation at the top of the slide, which you can rewrite as A minus lambda i z is equal to zero. And if A minus lambda i were invertible, then you could pre-multiply this equation by the inverse of a minus lambda i to get z is equal to zero. But z by definition has to be a non-zero solution, which is a contradiction. So lambda is an eigenvalue of a if and only if the matrix a minus lambda i is singular. And this implies that the determinant of the matrix a minus lambda i must be equal to zero. In other words, the eigenvalues of a can be computed by solving the polynomial of degree n that's obtained by setting the determinant of this matrix to zero. Now we'll show that if you have a set of real and distinct eigenvalues of a matrix A, call them lambda 1 to lambda k, then the corresponding set of eigenvectors z1 to zk are linearly independent. This is extremely useful in transforming A into a simpler form. So we'll prove this by contradiction. Suppose that lambda 1 to lambda k are real and distinct eigenvalues, but the corresponding eigenvectors z1 to zk are not linearly independent. Then let the largest number of linearly independent eigenvectors in this set be j, and we're assuming that j is strictly less than k. Now we can always relabel these eigenvalues and eigenvectors so that the first j are linearly independent. And furthermore, since there are at most j linearly independent eigenvectors, we can express the eigenvector zj plus 1 as a linear combination of the first j eigenvectors using real coefficients c1 to cj, not all of which are 0. Now if you pre-multiply this equation by the matrix A and use the definition of an eigenvector, you get the expression shown on the slide and here all we've done is to pre-multiply by a and recognize that for any eigenvector zj, a times zj is just lambda j times zj. Now note that lambda j plus 1 must be non-zero. To see why, note that if it was zero, then the left-hand side of this expression would be zero, and the right-hand side would have at least one non-zero coefficient, since all the eigenvalues lambda 1 to lambda j must be non-zero when lambda j plus 1 is zero. Here we're using the fact that all the eigenvalues are distinct, and at least one of the coefficients c1 to cj is non-zero. So we would have a linear combination of the z1 to zj eigenvectors with at least one non-zero coefficient such that the linear combination equals zero and this would contradict the fact that these eigenvectors are linearly independent. Now since lambda j plus one is non-zero we can just divide through the expression by this and we see that we now have two different ways of expressing zj plus one as a linear combination of the eigenvectors z1 to zj. 
And this is impossible if Z1 and Zj are linearly independent, and Zj plus 1 is a linear combination of these, then the coefficients for this linear combination are uniquely determined. And you should verify that there must be at least one coefficient Ti that differs from the coefficient Ci. So Zj plus 1 can be expressed in two different ways as a linear combination of Z1 to Zj. And this is a contradiction. Now suppose that all eigenvalues of A are real and distinct, and the corresponding eigenvectors are Z1 to Zn. A is an n by n matrix. In that case, if we define the matrix P by setting the jth column of P equal to the jth eigenvector, then this matrix is invertible, since all the eigenvectors are linearly independent. And furthermore, it can be used to diagonalize A. In other words, the matrix P inverse AP is a diagonal matrix, lambda, with the eigenvalues lambda1 to lambda n on the main diagonal. Now this is just a corollary of the result we've just proved, but let's just go through the argument. Let Ej denote the jth column of the identity matrix, so this is just a column vector with zeros everywhere except for 1 in the jth position. Now note that the jth column of the P matrix is just the jth eigenvector, Zj. So if we look at the jth column of the matrix P inverse AP, this is just P inverse A times the eigenvector Zj. Now use the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to replace azj by lambda jzj to get the expression shown on the slide. And now note that since p inverse times p is just the identity matrix, p inverse times the jth column of p must be the jth column of the identity matrix, which is ej. So we get the expression shown on the slide. In other words, the jth column of the matrix p inverse ap is just a column of zeros except for a lambda j in the jth position. And this proves that p inverse ap is just a diagonal matrix lambda as claimed. Now to finish up, let's consider complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. First we'll show that these arise in conjugate pairs. In other words, if the matrix has an eigenvalue a plus i beta, where i is the square root of negative 1, and the associated eigenvector is u plus i v, then a must also have an eigenvalue a minus i beta, which is the complex conjugate of the eigenvalue a plus i beta, and furthermore, it must have an associated eigenvector u minus iv, which is the complex conjugate of u plus iv. And the proof is extremely straightforward. Let's run through it quickly. If you take a times the eigenvector u plus iv, it's equal to the corresponding eigenvalue times u plus iv. Now let's equate the real and imaginary parts of the two sides of this expression, and you get what's shown on the slide. You can use these to get an expression for a times u minus iv, as shown on the slide, and just simplify and collect terms to show that u minus iv must be an eigenvector for a with corresponding eigenvalue alpha minus i beta. Now it's useful to visualize these eigenvalues as points in the complex plane as shown on the diagram here. And it's especially useful to view these in polar coordinates. So if r is the distance of the eigenvalue from the origin and theta is the angle that this makes with the real line, alpha and beta can be expressed in terms of r and theta as shown at the bottom of the slide. Now the stability of a dynamical system is going to depend crucially on whether its eigenvalues all lie inside the unit disk in the complex plane. In other words, on whether r is strictly less than 1 for all complex conjugate pairs of eigenvalues. Now when you have complex eigenvalues, you can't diagonalize A, but you can do something similar. Suppose that A is a 2n by 2n matrix with n distinct pairs of complex conjugate eigenvalues and associated complex conjugate eigenvectors. Now I'll state without the proof the following claim. If you take the 2n real vectors, consisting of u1, v1, all the way to un, vn, these are the real and imaginary parts of the eigenvectors, then these 2n vectors are linearly independent. Now note that a u j can be written as shown on the slide. Here u j is the real part of the jth pair of complex conjugate eigenvectors. Now using the definition of an eigenvector, we get the expression shown on the slide. Here we've just replaced a times the eigenvector by the corresponding eigenvalue times the eigenvector. Now if you simplify and collect terms, you get the following expression for a u j. And you can run through the same exercise to get an expression for a v j. And we'll use these expressions in a moment. Now define the 2n by 2n real matrix P by using the real and imaginary parts of the eigenvectors. Now since these columns are all linearly independent, P is an invertible matrix. Now as before, consider the matrix P inverse a P. In particular, let's look at column 2j minus 1 of this matrix. Now you can get the expression shown in the slide by first recognizing that column 2j minus 1 of the p matrix is just uj, and then using the expression we just derived, which you see at the bottom of the slide here. 
Now recognize that since P inverse times P is just the identity matrix, and uj and vj are just columns of P, this expression can be simplified to give you the following. And you can run through the same argument for the even numbered columns of P inverse AP to get the expression shown on the slide. Now let's think about what this says. Take j is equal to 1 and think about what the first column of P inverse AP looks like. You should convince yourself that this is a column that contains alpha j in the first position, negative beta j in the second position, and a bunch of zeros after that. Now think about the second column. The second column consists of beta j in the first position, alpha j in the second, and a bunch of zeros after that. Now go through this reasoning for all the other columns of P inverse AP, and you'll see that you end up with a block diagonal matrix, where each block is a 2 by 2 matrix and you have n blocks. And the elements of the block dj are as shown on the slide, and you can express these in terms of rj and theta j by thinking back to where the eigenvalues lie in the complex plane. Now let's put together everything we have so far by looking at the general case of distinct eigenvalues. Suppose that the matrix A has k real eigenvalues and 2L complex eigenvalues where each eigenvalue is distinct. Suppose the jth pair of complex eigenvalues is given by alpha j plus or minus i beta j and define dj as shown on the slide. Then there exists a matrix P that's invertible such that if you take P inverse AP, you end up with a block diagonal matrix. This consists of a K by K diagonal matrix in the top left hand corner, where each diagonal element is a distinct eigenvalue, and a block diagonal 2L by 2L matrix in the bottom right hand corner, where each block is a 2 by 2 matrix, and all other elements of this matrix are zero. Now we'll see the usefulness of this in a later segment when we consider difference equation systems because it allows us to change the coordinates of the system in such a way that makes the analysis a lot simpler. But we'll do that next time and we'll stop here for this segment.